just two weeks ago, the first institutional returns of artworks looted during the British sacking of Benin City in 1897 took place in Cambridge and Aberdeen. At last, it appears that progress is being made. Many European museums have now pledged to return looted Benin treasures. Just prior to the return of the Okokor at uh, Jesus College, the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge hosted a reception for the Benin Dialogue Group, a group that includes key Nigerian stakeholders, including representatives of the OBA, the National Commission for Museums and Monuments, the Edo State Government, as well as representatives of European museums holding Benin collections. Before the OBA's brother and senior representative, the museum's director, Nick Thomas, reiterated the intention, indeed the expectation, that it would be returning its collection of artworks looted from Benin in 1897. While at the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, the Benin Dialogue Group delegates also visited an exhibition, and it is this exhibition that I'd like to talk about briefly today. The exhibition, Re-Entanglements, Colonial Collections in Decolonial Times, is the culmination of a collaborative project that I've been leading over the last four years, also called Re-Entanglements. I've only time to discuss this very briefly now, but I invite you to visit the project website, re-entanglements.net, and of course, the exhibition itself, to get a fuller sense of what we've been doing. As treasures, looted in the context of a violent colonial military campaign, the case of the so-called Benin bronzes is from an ethical point of view, relatively straightforward. And museums are increasingly acknowledging that their claim on these artworks is not ethically supportable. The Reentanglements Project and exhibition is concerned with archives and collections where the case is, I'd suggest, not so straightforward. And it is the question of the status of these cultural materials that I should like to pose in this short presentation. The exhibition itself is conceived as a space of debate. Its various installations use the archives and collections from a series of colonial anthropological surveys in Nigeria and Sierra Leone to pose questions about the significance and values of these materials today. Can the legacies of colonial projects, photographs, sound recordings, botanical specimens, written descriptions, contribute to contemporary projects of decolonizing history and reclaiming heritage. The surveys were, were led by this man, Northcote Thomas, who was the first government anthropologist to be appointed by the British Colonial Office. He led three anthropological surveys in southern Nigeria between 1909 and 1913, the first of which was among Edo-speaking communities. And during this time, he spent several months in Benin City itself. This was, of course, just 12 years after the British military campaign. He conducted a fourth survey in Sierra Leone in 1914 to 15. The exhibition is not about the surveys themselves, but rather with what we might call the decolonial afterlives of the materials that emerged from them and which have been hidden away in museum storerooms and archives for over a century. This display case provides some of the background context and shows the technologies used by Thomas and his local assistants that produced the archival materials. Unfortunately, there isn't time now to discuss the various displays. One thing the exhibition seeks to do, however, is to recognize the plurality of perspectives and responses that these colonial images, objects, sounds, and texts elicit. For many, these physical type portraits epitomize the violences of colonial racial science. But what is understood as an offensive, objectifying image by one person may be cherished by another for the visceral connection it affords with an ancestor. We've collaborated with many Nigerian and Sierra Leonean artists, inviting them also to interrogate these images and artifacts. We've mined the archives and collections for metaphors that speak to the coloniality of their context, metaphors of damage and fragmentation, but also intimations of repair and transformation. I'd like to um, play just a short clip of a documentation film uh, about the exhibition that we've made, which hopefully will give you a, a sense of the, of the exhibition and the kind of debates we're trying to, uh, to provoke. The way I see folks who were colonized, I, I like to think of us as um, 
a very strong and beautiful people, I think it's very, very important that we don't erase what happened or we don't try to rewrite history. We had amazing crafts, we had you know, our own cultures, history, our sense of um, self. We had our own civilizations, they still exist. It's not just the, 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 the item, it's the story around it. I thought seeing the reconstructed pots and the, and the broken bits, and the, it just told the story on its own. When I began to make the fragments, I began to think about Africa as a fragmented people, right from when the African continent was cut up in Berlin, same fragmentation has continued up to today. They are still fragmenting us. Probably like many, many, many of the characters that Northcourt um, encountered and took photos of, they all have very um, significant things, topics to talk about. In the time I had left, I'd like to focus on the questions posed by this installation of a quarry, sometimes called rattle stamps, acquired by Northcote Thomas in Benin City in 1909. The are juxtaposed with photographs from Thomas's surveys, showing similar stars in their cultural context. In the background is this image of the ancestral altar in Chief Azomo's palace, also from 1909. You can see the Okore leaning against the back wall of the altar. They were traditionally commissioned to be carved by an eldest son on the passing of his father and placed on the altar. Collectively, they presence the spirits of the ancestors. Okore are also used in ceremonies relating to the various Edo deities or Ebo. These carry representations of the Ebo at the top. Here, for example, are Northcote Thomas's photographs documenting the use of a quarry during the Ovia festival in Iowa, a few miles north of Benin City. Tom has also made audio recordings of the various stages of the ceremonies he's fo he photographed. Families, especially chiefly families, still have ancestral altars, which still bear Okure. Here is the present altar in the Azomo's palace, and here is the Azomo himself holding Thomas's photograph of the same altar as it was 110 years before. One can buy ready-made Okure in Benin City today, or commission a carver to make one. But back to the questions posed by those Okure collected by Northcote Thomas. It is often suggested that all collections in ethnographic or world cultures museums were looted or stolen like the Benin bronzes. In fact, the majority of collections were acquired through purchase or exchange. And this is one of the reasons why conducting provenance research is so important. These Akure, for instance, were not stolen from some ancestral altar in an act of desecration. Through surviving correspondence, we know that Thomas commissioned them to be made. In a letter to Charles Hercules Reed of the British Museum, dated July 14th, 1909, Thomas writes that, quote, I have ordered all the, the jujus, quote, of Benin City to be carved. Probable cost £25. That's approximately equivalent to £3,000 today, so a substantial commission. Thomas was under the impression that Reed had agreed that the British Museum would acquire the collections he was making and reimburse the outlay he had made. This was one of the reasons he kept such detailed accounts of transactions. In his reply, however, Reed states that Thomas had got this wrong. Referring to the Akure Thomas had commissioned, Reed writes, quote, I am by no means sure that I want these modern things made to order, as it were. Reed was, incidentally, a central figure in the British Museum's acquisitions of the Benin treasures looted in 1897. Along with the majority of Thomas's collections, the Akure were eventually acquired by the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge. Here are the catalogue pages, which list the various deities, or Ebo, carved at the tops of the stars. And here 
are the corresponding aquarium zones. In correspondence with Bernard Struck, the curator of the Museum for Volkerkunde in Dresden, dating to 1924, Thomas mentions the aquare, noting that he had commissioned the head of the wood and ivory carvers guild to make them. In anticipation of the re-entanglements exhibition, we also commissioned a traditional carver in Benin City to make an aquari. Here is Felix Ekator making the staff in his workshop. At its top is a carving of Northcote Thomas. We place this newly carved aquari in the display alongside those commissioned by Thomas as a kind of disruption. Felix Ekator's aquari poses a question regarding Thomas himself. Is this colonial anthropologist a worthy ancestor? Should his memorial stand? Should we remember him as an agent of colonialism or as someone who tirelessly documented Nigerian cultural heritage? It also poses a question regarding the status of the historical Okori and other collections acquired in similar circumstances. How legitimate is the museum's claim on these heritage objects? Ethically, is there a substantive difference between these historically acquired aquarii and the aquarii that we ourselves commissioned? These things are all entangled in colonial histories, histories and entanglements that are not finished. But my question is whether we do not require a more nuanced understanding of such colonial collections in these decolonial times. Thank you.